today the first Sunday in Lent. And this whole for this first Sunday. Good to be here again in Benita, in Oregon. Because we're the first Sunday is taken from St. Paul's second letter of Corinthians chapter six. Brethren, we exhort you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, In an accepted time have I heard thee, in the day of salvation have I helped thee. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Give me no offense to any man, that my ministry be not bad. But in all things let us exhibit ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience and tribulation, in necessities and distresses, in stripes and prisons, in seditions and labors, in watchings and fastings, in chastity and knowledge, in long suffering, in sweetness, in the Holy Ghost, in charity unfeigned, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the armor of justice on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet known, as dying and behold we live, as chastised and not killed, as sorrowful and yet always rejoicing, as needy yet enriching many, as having nothing and possessing all things. And then the Gospel, taking that according to St. Matthew chapter 4. <coughs> At that time, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterwards he was hungry. And the tempter coming said to him, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Who answered and said, It is written, Not by bread and bread alone doth man live, but every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him upon the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, that he hath given his angels charge over thee, and in their hands they shall they bear thee up, lest thou, that perhaps thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil took him up into a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and said to him, All these will I give thee, if falling down, thou wilt adore me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. For it is written, The Lord thy God shalt thou adore, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. That's for the words of today's holy God. season of Lent, <clears throat> it says that our Lord, as he began his battle in the three and a half years, the Spirit led him to the desert to be tempted. And you have to remember that temptation is something which is necessary in this life. And it says, remember concerning the just man, the sacred scripture says, blessed is the just man who could have sinned, but did not. And remember also that God gave us free will making us different from the animals. The animals can never do wrong. The animals can never be displeasing to God. And that is a wonderful thing. However, the animals can also never see God face to face. The animals can never earn any, any reward for the good that they do. They cannot be punished for the bad they do on the negative side because they're not responsible, but neither can they be rewarded for the good they do because they're also not responsible. They just simply show forth the beauty and the glory of God. But God decided to create two creatures, angels and men, who would have the power to choose to do good. And this is the most wonderful power that he gave us, the power to choose to do good. However, if we could only do good, then that power would not be of any value. We have the power to choose to do good, and this power means that if we choose to do good, if we do what God intends us to do and choose good, then we can have a reward of seeing him face to face. And we can have a happy life. And there can be all kinds of treasures you can open to our hearts, all kinds of feelings we can have that animals cannot experience, the feeling of love and the, the feeling of consolation, and all these wonderful feelings, not just simply the, 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 the mind and heart being filled with truth and being filled with love, but also feelings come also because we have we were creatures that can make choices and we can experience great joys. And it, this is possible only because he gave to us a free will. The angels also, who they don't have the passions, they don't have the feelings, but they can experience the most wonderful joy because they are in the presence of God. 
only because they have the power to make a free choice. However, one of the conditions of this power is that it is not worthy of reward, it is not worthy of something wonderful, unless there is the ability to make a bad choice. And, there, and, and the ability to make a bad choice is always there, but if there's no proposal of a bad choice, then there can be no reward for making a good one. If there's no proposal of doing something that isn't good for us, there can be no benefit for doing something that is good for us. And therefore, the first temptation that was provided to the angels was provided by God himself. And the first temptation that was provided to Adam and Eve was also provided by God himself. Because God, through the angels, he told them that he was going to become man. And they are intellectual creatures. Who provided that first temptation? God. God gave them perfect intellect. And then he said, I'm going to do something that you cannot understand. I'm going to do something which makes no sense to you. <clears throat> Using your own angelic intellect, which is the most perfect intellect. That is to become man, to lower himself to the level of man, to make a woman his mother, and to have them serve the woman as the queen of heaven, and have them worship him in his humanity, and obey him in his humanity, and they don't understand. They had to make an act of the will. <clears throat> it was a temptation for them, because we're supposed to follow our mind. <clears throat> we're supposed to follow our reason. But sometimes reason doesn't perfectly understand, and therefore God gave a temptation to the angels. You don't understand yourself, why God would become man. But you do understand God and that he is good. And you understand that all things came from him and God can never do anything that's not good. And you also understand that God has a greater intelligence than you. But you can't understand why God's doing this, making himself man. Why is he going to become the head of all creation in the form of human flesh? You must choose to accept God over your own intellect. You have the power to accept your intellect over God you must choose that God over your own intellect. And Lucifer made the decision of pride, but the temptation was made by God. And, and St. Michael made the decision of who is like unto God, and he followed God. The temptation made Michael into a great saint, and the temptation turned Lucifer into a devil. And that was the first temptation ever given on the very first day of creation, and it caused a division between light and darkness. So that those of light passed the temptation, and they followed St. Michael into heaven. And those of darkness failed the temptation, and they followed Lucifer, who was the former carrier of light, into the fires and dark fires of hell. Temptation in and of itself is not a terrible thing, that there must be temptation. And then Adam was given a temptation. Don't eat of the forbidden fruit, the fruit in the center of the garden. He had to have a knowledge that there was some fruit that he could not eat, but it didn't tell him why he couldn't eat it. You simply be obedient. And the devil came and said, you're being told not to eat this because you, are, you, you understand that, that there's a reason why God is telling you not to eat this because he doesn't want you with knowledge of good and evil. And why would he not want you to have that knowledge? And Eve did not understand. And she had to choose between accepting the God of a greater intellect than her and, and the God of infinite goodness over her own intellect and understanding. And she chose to follow her own intellect just like Lucifer decided to follow his. She then went and explained to Adam, and there was a debate. And the end of the debate was, Adam also decided to choose his own understanding over the understanding of God. Temptation, the first temptation is provided by God. And God provides us temptation in order that we might choose his ways, choose his teaching, choose his knowledge over our knowledge. We are creatures of intellect, and God wants us to be creatures of intellect. We are supposed to follow our minds, and God wants us to follow our minds. But there will be times when our minds can't figure things out. There will be times when our minds don't know precisely what to do, but our minds do know God said do this. God said do this. But we don't understand why God said do this. And therefore, we are tempted to say, I must follow my intellect. God told me to follow my intellect. And I don't understand why this is why God wants to become man. I don't understand why God allows evil in the world. I don't understand why God wishes to be crucified. I don't understand why he allows wicked priests and bishops in the church. I don't understand so many things. Why there are temptations and why we must suffer and die. I don't understand all these things. 
And I don't understand perfectly these things. I have some little understanding, but I don't understand why these difficult troubles are coming my way. And I must choose, do I accept what God says, or do I accept what I think over what God says? And so that this is the origin of temptation, hence the very first temptation, and the foundation of all temptation is pride. Every single temptation is a form of the temptation of pride. To choose my intellect and my understanding and my will over the will of God and over the intellect of God. And hence it is a lie. And this is why the, the chief creator of all temptations, one of the reasons that he is called the father of lies. But we must experience temptation. We must experience temptation in order to go to heaven. Blessed is a just man who, is, who could have sinned but did not. And so one of the great lies of the devil is that when you become a saint, when you join the kingdom of God, when you get baptized, when you become a traditional Catholic, when you get married and a good Catholic parent, a good Catholic girl and a good Catholic guy, when you're in the right parish, when you're in the right place, you will reach a situation in this world where you will have either no temptations or a very few temptations, and so light of temptations it will be extremely easy for you to conquer them. And so that we want to go to a place in this world where there is no temptation. And yet the scripture is very clear. From the very beginning, even before there was a fall, there was temptation. And until the very end of the world, when, when, when the Antichrist is put to death, and he's already dead, and 45 days remain between the death of the Antichrist and the end of the world, during those 45 days, there shall be temptation. There were temptation before the fall, and there should be temptation after the death of the Antichrist. There must be temptation. God allows our temptation in order to prove our will, to prove our strength. And then we consider also concerning temptation, that there must be temptations, but God gives us always more than enough grace to conquer the temptations. And St. Gregory the Great was speaking about what a temptation is and how it works. He says there are three stages to a temptation, every temptation. The first stage is the suggestion. The suggestion to do something against the law of God. And our mind tells us this isn't right. I'm being suggested to tell some, to do something about against the law of God, against one of the Ten Commandments, against the seven virtues. And I'm, I'm getting tempted to do something against the commandments, against the virtues, and there is a suggestion to do something that is against the law of God. The second stage is called delectation, or the feeling of pleasure, the feeling of the temptation. When the temptation goes to the second stage, we feel the temptation, the pleasure, or we feel the anger, or we feel the pride, or we feel the greed, the desire for the money, we feel the desire for vengeance, or we feel whatever the temptation is, the feeling comes into us. And St. Gregory points out, in this feeling, there is not sin. It's the second stage. The first stage is the suggestion of temptation. The second stage is the experience of the temptation. That is, the temptation actually enters my soul so that I am tempted to say yes to it. The very many temptations, they are gotten rid of at the suggestion stage. And these don't reach the level of true temptation. But temptations really reach the level of temptation when we are tempted, actually feel a desire to go against the law of God. And this is the second stage of temptation called delectation or the feeling of pleasure. And many, many souls believe they have committed sins once they reach the second level. But in fact, they are not sins. When we feel the temptation, when we feel the desire for the pleasure, the desire for the anger, the desire for the vengeance, the desire for the pride, the desire for whatever it is, is contrary to the law of God, each one of the different forms of desire, these feelings are not sin. They are the second stage. And then there's the third stage, which is the sin itself. And the sin itself is when I consent to the delectation. When I freely say, I want this pleasure, I want this violence, I want this money, I want this pride, I want this whatever it is. So when we make the delectation, when we make the consent to the delectation, that is where sin resides. Because sin is in the will. And remember also, the feelings go the other way as well. There's a suggestion from God that you should follow his law. And then there is a feeling that we really want to follow it. But when we feel the consolation of, I'm going to be good from now on, and I'm never going to be bad, and I'm going to always be good, this is actually referred to by the dam as temptation also. Mother Annette, when she went to hell in 1937, a German lady went to hell, she spoke of her last temptation. 
And she said, I was tempted before she went to hell. And she says, you received a strong temptation. And the temptation was to go to Mass. She had a temptation to go to Mass on the Sunday morning that she died and went to hell. She woke up and said, well, I think I could go to Mass today. But it was a beautiful Sunday. The weather was good. And she overcame the temptation. And she said to her husband, let's go picnic. Because we can always go to Mass on another Sunday when it's raining. But today is a good day, therefore let us not go to Mass today. And it was her last call of grace. And she called that call of grace a temptation. So that it was a feeling to do something good. She felt the desire to go to Mass. She felt the desire to return to God. The desire to go to confession. Well, she didn't actually go to Mass. She didn't actually go to confession. She didn't actually return to God. She remained in her state of mortal sin. So we can actually take the, the stage of temptation and put it on both sides. The side of the devil, by which we are living in the grace of God, and the devil says, I suggest to you to do something evil. Then you feel the desire to do that evil thing. And this is not sin. But when you consent to the desire, that is where the sin exists. And on the flip side, we are sometimes have a suggestion... <coughs> To do a work of charity, <coughs> to go to Mass on Sunday, to do any good work, to fulfill our duty. We have a feeling like we're really going to do it, but then it never happens. <coughs> and when it never happens, that means we didn't do it, and therefore we don't deserve a reward for having done it. And so, the, just and on the flip side, we feel a desire to do something wicked, but we don't. We don't consent to the desire, then we don't reserve a reward of punishment. And on the good side, we feel a desire to do something good, but we don't actually do it. We don't deserve the reward. The reward and the punishment both consist in the third stage, which is a consent. Now, there are two types of consent. The first consent is called inefficacious consent, or valetas. I would like. This consent is a lie. It is not a consent. This is a consent that we all make. We make firm resolutions to lose weight. Everyone makes a firm resolution to lose weight. You all join the gym. We all get the diet plan. And we made a firm resolution. We bought the book, the Fatkins book. We are ready to make, we're going to lose weight. We got the book. We got the diet plan. We got the gym membership. And we just gained 10 pounds from the cheesecake we had yesterday. And so the fact is, we, made, we actually did some physical things. But we didn't do those things required to achieve the goal. And this is a fake consent. Now, this consent is done on both sides. There's a fake consent to commit sin, and there's a fake consent to do good. And so we have the temptation to do something bad. We have the temptation to do something bad, and you know, and this is what happens when, when, uh, when the, the, the mother says to the child, you do that again, I'm going to kill you. You do that again, I'm going to kill you. Well, she's never going to kill the child, but she attempted to do something. And the fact is that, and that there's no real desire to, to, to kill the child, nor there's any act to actually do so. So that the first stage of temptation, suggestion of the temptation. The second stage of temptation, the feeling of the pleasure. The third stage of temptation, the consent. And if the consent is, a, is not a real consent, there is not mortal sin. That's why we say in the three conditions of a mortal sin that there must be grave matter, there must be sufficient reflection. You don't do it in your sleep. You know, that you're aware of what's going on. And then there must be full consent. A partial consent means venial sin or an imperfection. But in order to be mortal sin, it must be a full consent of the will. And the same thing is true on the other side. Very often we do good things. We do holy things. We do spiritual things. And we consent to them. But we don't give full consent. We give partial consent. And so that there will there be some benefit of the soul, but because we're not doing full consent, there will not be the, the benefit of the saints. So that when the mother said Virgin Mary swept the floor, she gave full consent. She swept the floor because it was the will of God. She swept the floor with the greatest and imperfection of love. She swept the floor with absolute perfection in her heart. So that when she swept the floor, it was greater value to God than the martyrdom of the martyrs. It was greater value because she had a full consent of her immaculate heart to that act of being pleasing to God. 
And that whereas others do good acts and they get some partial reward, but they don't give their full consent. And so we must strive to give our full consent to God and reject the full consent of Satan. And in regard to the temptations themselves, the three famous temptations, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And remember that these temptations must be given to us. And what does it say in the sacred scripture again? Blessed is the just man who could have sinned but did not. And though God led Jesus Christ in his humanity into the desert to be tempted, because it is given for all real men to be tempted. And even Jesus Christ in his humanity, who could never fall, because of God being so perfectly united to his humanity, but being a real man, he could not be a real man unless he experienced temptation. So God allowed him, and not only allowed him, led him into the desert to experience temptation. And the head of the devils came to tempt him. So he would receive not only temptation, but he would receive the heaviest temptation that a man can receive. And this tells us that the more perfect we are in God, the more devils attack us. Yet, as the devils attack us more, so God gives more grace. And always the grace exceeds the temptation. I was reading the sacred scripture the other day, one of the masses of St. Titus, and the just man is going to receive great temptation that he might overcome. He will run into great tribulations that he might overcome. God will give great tribulations to the saint so that he might overcome them and become even greater reward in heaven. Small tribulations to those who receive a small reward, medium tri tribulations to those who receive a medium reward, and great tribulations to those who receive a great reward. And always God gives a greater grace, no matter how terrible the temptations are. Our Lord Jesus Christ was led into the desert and he experienced the three great temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the Satan himself came to give these temptations. Now what is the answer to these temptations? Even the temptation of the flesh. What does uh, the devil say? These, these little, are loaves of bread. Use your miraculous power and turn them into bread. Because Satan knew that Jesus Christ had miraculous power. He knew well the powers of the saints of the Old Testament. And he knew that he could easily turn it into bread. He said, turn them into bread. These look like little, these little round stones look like little loaves of bread. Turn them into bread. But what was the answer of Lord Jesus Christ? It is written, not by bread alone doth man live, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Hence we notice, even to overcome the temptations of the flesh, the most low and base of temptations, even to overcome the temptations of the flesh, the answer is every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. So that prayer and the contemplation of the scriptures and the speaking to God is necessary to overcome temptation, even the temptations of the flesh. While there are material things that must be done, such as fleeing the temptation and taking some practical steps to overcome temptation, the fact is that prayer is the principal weapon against temptation, and contemplation of the truth and the things of God is the principal weapon against temptation, including the temptations of the flesh. We do not live by bread alone. We are tempted by bread. We are tempted by all the temptations of the flesh to fill ourselves with a pleasure coming from this world. How do we respond to that? By filling ourselves with the pleasure that comes from God. And this is the pleasure of talking to God. The pleasure of walking every day with God. The pleasure of being with God. This is the temptation. This is the way to overcome temptation. So that prayer is the first step to overcome all temptation, including the lowest temptation and the basis temptation of the flesh. There's no, oh, prayer is essential. And even and, and many souls that are in hell said, had they prayed, had they continued in prayer, they would not have lost their souls. And so prayer is the first and most important means to overcome temptation. By every word, by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. And the same, of course, with the other two temptations. So it's considered a battle against temptation, and that we shouldn't be disturbed that we're going to be tempted in one way or another throughout our lives. And remember, the grace of God is more powerful than the attacks of the devil. And God led our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus Christ in the desert to be tempted in order that he might show his strength and prepare himself for a real battle to fight against the devil during the three and a half years of the public ministry and have the great victory of his crucifixion. And we can follow along those same paths until we arrive at our resurrection with God in heaven. We can be fighting against temptation and understand we shouldn't be overly disturbed that we experience temptations. And remember the three stages of temptation. First of all, suggestion, which is the, the weird, and then secondly, the feeling or delectation of temptation, and then thirdly, the consent, and it's only in the consent that sin lies. So it's battle against the temptations, and remember the flip side is also true, 
that we are sometimes tempted to do good, but that we never actually do it. So let's make sure that we do actually do good and not simply feel about that we're going to one day do good and then uh, and, uh, so that we actually follow the, the suggestions of Christ and the good angel and reject the suggestions of Satan and the bad angel. Praise God bless you all, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.